we think this is going to work, and this is my daughter who helped me so much. Um, also, for the very last session of this women's um, scriptures thing, we I would like to know if any of you have a favorite verse of a favorite sacrament song. And if you do, if you'll email me, it's a thetaw at gmail.com. And I'm, I'm thinking about trying to incorporate some of that. So I'd love your input. So you can, I want you to feel really a part of what we've been doing. So your favorite verse of a favorite sacrament song. We're going to focus on Christ. So, um, Okay, I'm using a few more slides than usual. She's just so nice to help. So the villagers in Nazareth were excited. There were never more than a couple dozen houses there, probably never more than 500 people in Nazareth. But there was now going to be a wedding of two remarkable and loved people. Joseph's father had visited Mary's father to agree on the marriage and the bride pay, price paid to her father, the wedding date, that made the contract and said these vows of betrothals. Mom, I, think like, I wonder if you could, I'm sorry, I just thought that my head's in the way of this. So, I you want to move this? Just put it on your lap, or is that? Do you need this closer? I don't even know stuff like that. So, Grant, he's talking about words I don't know. So, okay. So, usually this this engagement process happened when the, a girl started her menses. And that would mean someplace between maybe 12 and 14. The, the boys were usually 13 to 18. And it, this betrothal would last maybe a month to a year. The, even during the betrothal period, the couple was considered married, but the girl would still live with her parents and be supported by her father. But there were lots of fun preparations for the marriage. Mary, or Miriam, as was her name, means the beloved. She had a good mother. She had a happy childhood, and because she lived sort of in the rural part of, of Israel, she probably had more freedom to play with her friends and associate with people than she would have if she had lived in a a big city like Jerusalem. Her mother would have taught her to sew simple things from linen and, and uh, wool. She would have taught her to plant and harvest and cook and clean. It was probably a religious home, so they would have had a mezuzah that they would touch as they went in the door. That had been an Israelite tradition for a thousand years by now, probably. Um, there's evidence that Mary knew how to read, and she certainly knew the scriptures. Maybe her father taught her those skills. Joseph was a carpenter, which in that part of the world meant he worked with stone. He was probably busy working to build a house for his new bride. It was mainly the custom to uh, marry within your clan or tribe. But Mary and Joseph were Jews living in Galilee, which was in the north part of Israel. That area had been under the rule of foreigners for a long, long time now, hundreds of years. But some of the Jews, and sometimes they, they were ruled by foreign countries, but sometimes even the Jews, like the Maccabees, had conquered that. The Maccabees became known as the Hasmoneans, and they actually had uh, conquered Galilee about 100 years before Christ was born. So some people speculate that Mary and Joseph forebears would have come to the Galilee as functionaries from Jerusalem, who were sent there by the current rulers to both enforce the law of Judah, which would mean circumcision, and certainly collect the taxes for the temple and the priests. This is one possibility. Those functionaries would go to Galilee and probably return off into Jerusalem, but maybe retire in Galilee. The other possibility is that because Joseph and Mary's forebears were direct descendants of David, they were in line to be the lawful king. Joseph, particularly, was in line to be the lawful king of Judah. So he would prove a direct threat to the Hasmonean uh, rulers of Judah at this time. 
but there's also a need for obscurity. And this was sort of a, an unimportant corner of the mighty Roman Empire. Both Mary and Joseph had roots in Bethlehem because of David. Some people say that they, their families, particularly Joseph, might have lived there at some point or at least had property there, which would have made it easier for the Holy Family to live in Bethlehem after Christ's birth. But this period of betrothal, which is usually fun and a little hectic, um, was interrupted by the Annunciation. Gabriel, who was known in his mortality as the prophet Noah, must have been so happy to be the one to announce the birth of Christ to all these various witnesses. He probably was happy because now this Redeemer would, would, would be born that would redeem all those people that were drowned when he was alive. They'd waited so long in the spirit world, as had we. He probably appeared to Mary in her home where she would feel the most comfortable, but still a strange man in your room. Mary was troubled, which in Greek means thoroughly frightened or upset, but I'm sure she knew that God was aware of her. He says, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Mary is not overcome by fears and doubt. She only questions how, not if. How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Then comes the beautiful and sublime answer. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Christ, the Son of Mary, as his mortal mother, could die. As the Son of his heavenly Father, he could choose to die or not to die. Christ was Jehovah, the creator of worlds the God of the Old Testament. He condescended, he needed a mortal mother to help in the creation of his mortal body. Gabriel added to Mary these comforting information that there was someone she could share her this exciting news. Someone who was also experienced a miracle. That would be Elizabeth, who was in her old age, but in her sixth month of pregnancy. Then Gabriel says these very reassuring words, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Mary has absolute faith and absolute submission. She says, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Gabriel has calmed her fears, given her a message, gently answered her questions, and now he leaves her to ponder. She becomes pregnant with the sacred help of the Holy Ghost and becomes an absolute witness of Jesus Christ's divinity. She's the only woman in scripture that is known prophetically before she, she's born. She's known by God and chosen as the foreordained mother of his son in the, the flesh. There are five prophecies about her. In 734 BC, Isaiah says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. In 600 BC, Nephi sees a virgin most beautiful and far above and fair above all other virgins. He learns that she is the mother of the Son of God after the manner of the flesh. In 125 BC, an angel communicates to King Benjamin, who then says, He shall be called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the creator of all things from the beginning and his mother shall be called Mary. In 90 BC, Lamoni, the Lamanite king, says, I have seen my redeemer, and he shall come forth and be born of a woman. In 83 BC, Alma speaking to the people at Gideon says, the son of God cometh upon the face of the earth. He shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel. She shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. Heavenly Father knew all his spirit daughters and he chose Mary. He trusted her with his son. 
So Mary's pregnant, can't tell anyone, maybe feeling a little morning sick, and she takes this trip, I'm sure with other, other travelers, to Bethlehem, or to Jerusalem, to see Elizabeth. Elizabeth lived in a town that's now known as Ein Kerem, which is quite near Jerusalem. Her name means, God is my oath or my fortune. In Greek, the word cousin would have implied not just a first cousin, but a relative of some kind. She is Jewish, but she also has heritage from Levi or Aaron. And her husband, Zacharias, is uh, the only rightful high priest. That, would, that intermarriage would occur much more easily in a big city than in the outskirts. Um, Zacharias and Elizabeth are described as righteous and blameless, walking in all the commandments and ordinances. Tamar, remember her, and Elizabeth are the only two women in the scriptures to whom that word righteous is applied. I think that people thought of Zacharias and Elizabeth as a nice elderly couple that lived outside the city of Jerusalem. I'm sure that they probably had to grow crops to supplement Zacharias's income as a priest. And Elizabeth felt her barrenness was a quote, reproach among men. While he's alone in the Holy of Holies in the temple, Zacharias is visited by the angel uh, Gabriel, and he too is troubled, he's fearful. The angel says to him, fear not, thy prayer is answered. And he receives an answer to his very specific prayer. Thy prayer is heard, thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. The, the angel promises joy and gladness that many will rejoice at John's birth, that he'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll be a Nazarene and not allowed to drink strong drink. He'll be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. He'll turn many to God. Unlike Mary, Zacharias is a little dubious about this news. We're both old. Elizabeth's well stricken in years. Well, the angel then says that Zacharias will have this sign that he'll be both deaf and dumb because of his unbelief. <coughs> Elizabeth's attitude is one of total belief and gratitude. She says, thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days of wherein he looked upon on me to take away my reproach among men. Elizabeth knows that God is, is mindful of her problem of barrenness. She conceives and kind of hides herself for five months. I don't know if she's kind of feeling a little shy about this late life pregnancy or maybe just doesn't want to share her sacred experience with neighbors. I think it's really good for us to ask ourselves what gifts we've received or become aware of later in life. Now imagine the joyful meeting of Mary and Elizabeth. Mary, who's still not pregnant, obviously, she's just barely pregnant, would not have been showing. Yet, when she salutes or greets Elizabeth, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Ghost and their spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication. Blessed art thou among women, she says, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of the salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb. Elizabeth becomes a witness of Christ's divinity. But notice what her words said. She blesses, she praises Elizabeth. I think sometimes it's easy for us to mourn with those who mourn, but it, maybe it's a little bit harder to rejoice with those who rejoice. But that's what Elizabeth did. She is rejoicing with and for Mary. <coughs> now we come to something we may not be able to see. I think it's gonna work. Okay, this is what Mary replies. These may not be her words. It's called the Magnificat. And it certainly expresses her feelings at the way God's grace and power magnified her. For thousands of 2,000 years now, people in many churches have set this prayer of Mary's to music. And millions of women have identified with Mary and, and been inspired by her life and words. So 
these words are on the little handout, or you can read them here. And this should be a group of Catholic women that are both singing the words as you watch them serving together. wonderful to feel a kinship with Christian women everywhere throughout the ages that have honored Mary. But now in her life, Elizabeth was the only person that Mary was authorized to talk with. So imagine her relief and also great happiness as they shared the experience of their pregnancies together. Even more important is they shared their testimonies of the missions of their soon-to-be-born sons. I'm sure they searched and studied the the scriptures together and talked about raising these special children. For both, this was probably a period of days never to be forgotten and a time of real female bonding. Mary would not have been allowed at the birth of Elizabeth's baby because she had not yet had a baby. But I think that Elizabeth, as an older woman, bolstered Mary's faith and comforted her. And I think we need to ask ourselves how we can be mentors and helpers to younger women. After about three months, Mary leaves and Elizabeth has her baby. So imagine the scene at John's circumcision at eight days. All the friends of the family are there and they're urging that the, the boy be named Zacharias after his father. But Elizabeth, who knows, insists he be named John. And Zacharias confirms this in writing, after which his ears and mouth are open and he prophesies about how Christ's mission will be of mercy. What happens to Zacharias? We're not quite sure. That was one of the most common names of the time. Probably he's not the Zacharias that Christ talks about later as being killed in the temple. We don't know if Elizabeth has to function as a single mother. We do know at some point John is taken to the desert where he will be raised until his mission commences. Mary returns to her family. Now she's probably four and a half months pregnant, 
and beginning to show. We don't know how her parents or Joseph's parents find out about this. Mary is not authorized, so she doesn't discuss this sacred events even with Joseph. She's a very young and very pure woman. It must have been frustrating her, to her to not be able to justify herself, to talk to maybe her best friend or her mother at this point. But God has chosen well this remarkable woman. Christianity has made her a saint whom they want to intercede for them with her son. There have been hundreds, probably thousands of cathedrals in which people pay her tribute. There are images in every culture that's been Christian of her. And yet, Mary was silent. <coughs> Joseph figures out that Mary's pregnant and that would be a considered a legitimate birth because they are betrothed. But he knows her to be <coughs> virtuous and he knows he's not the father. So there must have been a lot of cognitive dissonance. It says he agonizes because he is a just man, an upright follower of Jewish law. He could annul the, the marriage by a public trial or by a private agreement, but even that would have still exigeed that he present the problem of her pregnancy before two or three witnesses. And he doesn't want this gossip. He doesn't want to hurt Mary, he loves her. He decides to put her away privily, quote, not willing to make her a public example. What does this tell us about Joseph and his hesit, his loving kindness, his mercy, his willingness to think about the needs of other people? Those are such important qualities in anyone, especially in the stepfather to God's son. Probably exhausted by, quote, thinking on these things, he's trying to figure out the honorable and kind thing to do. He falls asleep and the angel visits him in his dream, telling him to fear not that this event will be unique in the history of the world and that the baby is of God and will be called Emmanuel, God with us. Imagine Joseph's relief and yet his sort of huge sense of responsibility at his calling as this father to raise and protect the son of God in childhood. I love that Joseph, quote, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. He was obedient. It's clear why he was foreordained to the stepfather's role in eternity in mortality. Mary shows faith and restraint. She doesn't try to explain or defend herself. Others become aware of her pregnancy because she is, quote, found with child. I'm sure there was small town gossip, taunting men with their irreverent talk, possibly even by extended members of Joseph and Mary's family who weren't believers. This persists into Christ's adulthood in Nazareth. Well, well into her pregnancy, Mary accompanies Joseph as they walk, they probably couldn't afford a donkey, they walk to Bethlehem to be registered by descent to pay taxes since they both are descended from David. Remember how it feels to walk when you're really pregnant? A hundred miles. Bethlehem's about south, about five miles south of Jerusalem, and even at a population of as few as 300, but more likely a thousand, it must have seemed like a big place, especially at Passover season when it would have been crowded. The ends of the time were these circular places where the animals would be put at the, at, on the ground floor, and then the second floor, the people would be set in open stalls so you could kind of see into everyone else's stall. So most Christian scholars and Christian lore certainly says that Christ would have been born in a cave outside the city. It wouldn't have been unusual for a family to live in a cave, but it certainly would have ensured privacy at this really tender time. Jesus Christ was born in humble circumstances. The manger was a stone trough. There probably were animals, at least the scriptures don't talk about them. They were added later. They were probably alone. There may not have been a midwife or another woman to help Mary. Maybe God sent angels, but certainly he would ensure that the childbirth went well. The baby would have been rubbed with oil, swaddled at the 
with tying the arms at the wrist and at the elbows and bandaging the fingers so they wouldn't get twisted, covering the legs and head for two months. This was so the baby would stay warm and dry and the skin wouldn't get infection. Well, the shepherds get direct revelation from God. They both saw and heard the angels who said, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. These aren't very specific directions. So they had to become witnesses of Christ's divine worth to tell everyone they encountered as they searched for this baby. They heard the angel singing, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. Do you think you were privileged to be in that heavenly choir? My daughter had this friend in Paraguay whose patriarchal blessing said she sang in the heavenly choir at Christ's birth. And she didn't have a good voice. <laughs> so think about that. The shepherds then uh, were privileged to become uh, witnesses for they had heard and seen these heavenly messengers. They were, at that time at least, in the lowest social strata, probably didn't associate much with anyone in the city, particularly the upper classes. Sometimes sophisticated or wealthy people get kind of skeptical of spiritual things and find reasons to explain it away, like that didn't actually happen. But think of the disruption to Mary and the new baby if powerful, well-meaning people had come to, quote, manage things. Well, knowing of the angels and getting visited by the shepherds surely was a comfort to Mary and Joseph. You notice that they are not proclaiming Christ's divinity as witnesses at this time. In fact, Luke tells us that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. I personally am what you call an external processor. That means sometimes I don't know what I think until I hear myself say it. And that doesn't always serve me well. I think I probably said things about my children that I shouldn't have. <laughs> so Mary was an internal, internal processor. I don't think this is righteousness or, or not righteousness, but God needed someone with her quiet, reflective nature. And he provided different witnesses that were appropriate in different times and situations. Mary and Joseph were humble, obedient followers of the Mosaic laws. Some of the, the laws pertaining to childbirth were like the law of the name and circumcision, which happened at eight days, the law of purifications for mothers. The mother was considered unclean for the eight days before the circumcision, and then in the case of a boy, 33 days afterward, and would not have been allowed in the temple till that time. After that time, they were supposed to give a lamb for the burnt offering and a turtle dove or pigeon for the sin offering. If you didn't have a lamb, you couldn't afford a lamb, you could bring two turtle doves, which Mary and Joseph did. Then came the law of redemption for the firstborn. The firstborn son was considered to belong to God. So you had to pay five shekels to redeem him, buy him back. Isn't it ironic that Mary and Joseph brought the Lamb of God to the temple and he would be sacrificed and they paid to redeem the Redeemer. Mary and Joseph went to the temple to fulfill these laws, but they didn't know that God had prepared witnesses there. They probably would have entered the temple by the west gate, which would lead to where the court of women was, and that would be the only place that women were allowed to go into the temple. But the temple grounds were big. It was like a, a quarter of a mile just from the south to the north, and they were also busy and crowded, especially at this time of year. But remarkable events happened then. Luke says that Simeon, who was an older man who was just and devout, had been promised that he wouldn't die before it's in Christ. He was led by the Spirit to visit the temple that day. The Holy Ghost was upon him, and I'm sure had to help him find this holy family in the busyness of the temple. He holds the baby in his arms, and he becomes a witness as he prophesies of both Jesus and Mary. 
And Mary and Joseph marvel at his prophecies at the light and goodness and also the division that Christ's ministry will bring. What were Mary's thoughts as, as uh, Simeon turned to her and said, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. Surely that would have been a frightening thought for this new young mother as she pondered and contemplated her role as the mother of this God child. I think God's merciful when he doesn't allow us to know all the details of the challenges we'll face. Anna comes, it says, at that instant. She's also led by God. She is the daughter of Phanuel, and we know that El refers to Elohim in her father's name. She's of the tribe of Asher. Asher was the second son of Zilpah. She was married only for seven years, so she's now either 84 years old as a widow, or possibly even 104 years old. I think Rembrandt thinks she's 104. <laughs> In any case, it depends on how you interpret those scriptures. She is a widow. That word al almana means not spoken for, unable to speak. It's like nobody pays attention to you when you're a widow. The words in the scriptures most used to describe widows are weeping, mourning, desolation, poverty, indebtedness. Anna had made a deliberate choice. She, quote, departed not from the temple. She may have even found a little place there on the grounds to sleep. She may have been homeless. But she had spent her time serving God, fasting and praying. There's so many faithful widows and single women more than 50% of LDS women today are in that situation. So I think it's easy to feel marginalized. I feel marginalized even as an older woman and I haven't even experienced widowhood yet. But God is aware of her. He's aware of all of us. She know, he knows her service at the temple where he blesses her and rewards her for her life of service and goodness. Like Simeon, she's blessed to recognize deity. She might have attracted mockers as she thanked God for this blessing because it's easy to misconstrue people's honest, sincere worship, worship for oddity. Remember Eli and Hannah in the temple? But she becomes a witness of Jesus Christ's divinity. It says in Luke that she spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She had a testimony of Jesus Christ and she bore it. We don't know, maybe 30 years later, some of those people that saw her in the temple became believers in Christ. We have testimonies, even those of us who are widowed or older. I think it's really important for us to ask ourselves, how can we serve even as we age? Anna was the third female witness of Jesus Christ. Mary and Joseph lived in Bethlehem for the first few years of, of Jesus' life. Some doctors of this period were criticizing new mothers for not keeping their babies swaddled, for nursing them, or rocking them too much to calm them, for bathing them too often. I did all those things. I hope that God, I'm sure he provided helpful women, maybe angels on this side of the veil, or possibly even Mary's mother or Mary's mother-in-law could have come to Bethlehem to help, although they were probably raising children of their own. It was far and it was expensive. I'm sure that Mary had information of how she should take care of this baby. After they'd been living in Bethlehem, Jesus was probably still under two years of age. They become visited by the Magi, the wise men. Now it says that they're found in a house doing normal family things. But since the Magi were prominent men, they probably came with a caravan, which would have been interesting in that community in Bethlehem. We wonder what the neighbors thought. And the church video on this is absolutely wonderful. The expression on the face of one of those Magi will just really be helpful to you to worship, at least it is for me. We don't know the number, the identity, the ethnicity of the Magi. We do know they came from the East, that might have been Arabia, possibly they were Jews of the diaspora who had stayed in Persia after Cyrus had let the other Israelites return to Israel. 
We do know they had a purposeful journey. They had seen the star in the east. They had paid attention to it. Maybe others had seen it, but didn't know the prophecies about Christ, didn't know what it meant. The Magi came to worship. They came with gifts. And Christian lore says perhaps the gold was used to finance the family's trip to Egypt, the frankincense to anoint Christ's feet during his ministry, and the myrrh to embalm his body at his death. We really don't know. What we do know is that God provides for his children and for us. We do know the Magi were sincere. Unlike the shepherd witnesses, they were not allowed to get direct revelation, but God chooses many kinds of witnesses from many stratas of society. These prominent witnesses had earlier sought advice from Herod, who was the titular king of Judea. He was a descendant of Esau, and he was hated by the Jews. And he was brutal, and he killed people. And he was very threatened to hear of the birth of a, a potential king of Judah in Bethlehem. But Bethlehem was really not a center of power. It's kind of a podunk kind of town at this time. It's interesting how God has his treasures in obscure corners of the world while we assume history is being made in New York City. So Herod says to these magi, go search diligently so I can worship him. He's such a, he's such a hypocrite. He's killed his wife, two sons. He kills lots of people. He's really brutal. And when he finds out that they, the magi actually warned by in a dream, go home another way, he feels mocked and furious. So he orders that all the boys under two in Bethlehem and in the coast, he's very thorough, should be killed. Given Bethlehem's population at this time, that probably would have involved more than 20 little boys. Even that event wasn't bloody enough for Josephus to mention it in the history of the Jewish nation. But in Christianity, it's known as the slaughter of innocents. Matthew says there was lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. I don't know how Mary felt when she learned of these murders. I know that she must have felt grief for those children and also for their mothers and blessed knowing that God has protected her and his son. I hope she was also blessed to understand the gospel, which we learn as in Mormon, in the Book of Mormon, that these innocent children, like even like these children, and even the, the first sons, the young first sons of the Egyptians, would be saved by the atonement of her son. Now, Joseph receives another dream. He seems to receive the dreams as the head of the family, and this time he's told to flee into Egypt from Herod. <clears throat> Egypt's the traditional sanctuary. <laughs> for Israel. Remember Abraham? Remember others? So the Egyptian border is 38 miles south of Bethlehem, and this enables the prophecy that Matthew tells us to be fulfilled. Out of Egypt have I called my son. In Cairo, there is a church that purports to be where the Holy Family lived. There are churches and shrines all over the place in that part of the world. And I think the people that built them really had a sincere desire to worship and connect with God. And of course, I think some of them were interested in making money too. Well, after a period, Joseph gets another dream and is told he can go back to Israel. But now he's warned to not go to Bethlehem because Herod's son, Archelaus, has replaced him in Judea and he's also a terrible person. And so he's warned to turn, a, turn aside to Galilee and return to Nazareth. And I kind of wonder how Mary felt about that. Maybe she had some conflicted feelings. Must have been kind of nice for her to be free of the small town gossip while she lived in Bethlehem and especially in Egypt. But they go back and Luke says, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. There are lots of apocryphal stories about Christ and the miracles he did when he was little. They're probably not true. But in primary, I love singing that song, Jesus Once Was a Little Child. He played as little children play, the pleasant great claims of youth. 
and he never got vexed when the game went wrong, and he always told the truth. And I liked it because I had to figure out what vexed meant. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that the child that Christ was had his share of scraped knees and mean friends and colds, and he had normal physical growth, but astonishing spiritual and intellectual growth. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, Evidently, before he was 12 years old, Jesus had learned a great deal about his father's business. This knowledge could come to him by revelation, by visitation of angels, or in some other way. But his knowledge, so far as this life was concerned, had to come line upon line and precept upon precept. And the record indicates it's how, that's how Mary's knowledge of him came too. And don't you just think about that? You change these babies' diapers, and the next thing you know, they're saying and doing things that are just astounding. Well, the only known childhood incident of Mary, of Jesus, comes when Mary's in about her mid-twenties. Luke says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. Parents? It's so easy for an observer, even like Luke, to forget that Heavenly Father was the father parent of Jesus. Mary and Jesus leave the festivities after the Passover and they don't notice that Jesus is missing. And what parent hasn't done that? Both Mary and Joseph may have been distracted by other children which they would have had by this time. But they, quote, sought him among kinsmen and acquaintances. So for me, that is that they're assuming that I assume that Jesus had normal friendships and acquaintances. He had kids he hung out with. But Mary and Joseph turned back and spent three days looking for him. The Joseph Smith translation says, they found him sitting in the temple in the midst of the doctors and they were hearing him and asking him questions. When Mary sees this in the temple, she must have been increasingly astonished at this son. Joseph Smith and teachings of Joseph Smith says, when still a boy, he had all the intelligence necessary to enable him to rule and govern the kingdom of the Jews and could reason with the wisest and most profound doctors of law and divinity and make their theories and practice to appear like folly compared with the wisdom he possessed. But he was a boy only and lacked physical strength even to defend his own person and was subject to cold and hunger and death. But Mary must have been desperate with panic, worried sick, frustrated, not angry. She says, son, why hast thou dealt with us thus? And I think that that's interesting. I remember when my children were making a mess of the house and my brother-in-law said to me, Athelia, they're not trying to get you, they're just being children. I think that's something we need to think about as mothers. She says, behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing and I think I found in mothering that it's so much better to react to children's behavior we don't approve of with sorrow or disappointment than with anger. But Jesus' reply reminds his mother and Joseph that he knows his divine parent and some of his mission by the age of 12. He says, wist you not that I must be about my father's business? This is a reminder, not a rebuke. It's like when he calls his mother woman at the marriage in Cana and on the cross. He is become subject to Mary and Joseph and returns to Nazareth with them. But again, quote, his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. She's not called upon to witness of the divinity of her son to the priest or to the people at Jerusalem. She doesn't have to tell them all she knew and have experienced, and it might have opened her to ridicule. Mary and Joseph have other children, four sons and at least two daughters. We want to consider Mary in her role as a mother of this family. I think so often we think of her as the baby Jesus with the baby Jesus, but actually she was a mother of a lot of children. It's challenging to raise any exceptional child. But how does Mary, as an imperfect mortal and therefore an imperfect mother, parent, the Son of God. Was she allowed to explain the situation to them? Did she treat Christ differently? Did she feel a need to protect this special son? Who got the attention among her children? Did she compare her experience with him to later children? Did she marvel at his extraordinary characteristics? Did she encourage interest in nature or in people? Because certainly Christ was a careful observer and he used these observations later in his ministry to teach. 
Did they talk about things like this in family discussions? Were these part of dinner table talk? Maybe Mary felt like it was better to keep her knowledge of Christ's divinity sort of in the back of her mind to enable her to give him a normal home and childhood. In fact, Mary did a good job of not making Christ a celebrity in the community, so much so that when Jesus begins to teach in the synagogue and announces his divinity and his mission, his neighbors are, quote, amazed. Joseph uh, Smith translation adds a few verses to Matthew 2. And it came to pass that Jesus grew up with his brethren and waxed strong and waited upon the Lord for the time of his ministry to come. And he served under his father and he spake not as other men. Neither could he be taught, for he needed not that any man should teach him. But certainly Mary taught her sons things about growing up in a mortal world. Probably Joseph died early and Mary became a single parent. She might have been really lonely because she wasn't She'd have been able to talk with Joseph about who Jesus was, but she was not allowed to confide in others without specific permission, and we don't know what that was. I think she had a strong relationship with her co-parent, Heavenly Father. She would have had ongoing challenges, mother of a big family. As the eldest son, particularly after his father died, Jesus would have had a lot of responsibility in the family, and I'm sure Mary grew to rely on him. When he was 30 and he starts his ministry, it must have been difficult for Mary. She would be now in her mid-40s, and she was still raising children, some of whom could have been quite young. After Jesus was baptized and had fasted, been tempted by Satan, and called some of his apostles, he attends a wedding at Cana, which was a little town a few miles from Nazareth. Mary has a social crisis, and she asks Jesus to provide more wine. Possibly she was, had familiarity with his capabilities and maybe she had witnessed other miracles. John says in the Joseph Smith translation that Christ says, Woman, what wilt thou have me do for thee? That will I do. He's obviously willing. He wants to assist his mother. And she has absolute faith. She tells the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. This is a miracle, but privately Jesus says to his mother, Mine hour is not yet come. He reminds her again of his eternal identity and his eternal mission. When his hour came, because of his divine father and his perfectly righteous choices, he would pay the price for Mary's sin as well as for ours. He would overcome the sting of death for Mary as well as for, for us. Mary wasn't offended in this conversation with, her, with Jesus. But one takeaway is like us, Mary has to allow her son to separate from her physically and emotionally. Our children are not just an extension of us. They have to be allowed to become who they are and whom God wants them to become. We use our agency to allow them their agency. They need to live their own independent lives. There's this very most famous longitudinal study that started when JFK was a a freshman at Harvard and lasted till these men were in their 90s. And one of the most important findings is that children need to separate from their parents emotionally sometime in their 20s, or maybe they'll fail at this necessary task. It is necessary for emotional maturity. I think it's especially difficult for parents if a parent is alone or widowed. The process is always tender and sometimes painful, but I think we need to ask ourselves how we can facilitate our children's healthy separation from us. I think another painful part of Mary's experience with Christ was around the time he preached at the synagogue in Nazareth when he proclaimed his divinity and his mission. Mark says the people said, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? This would be bar Miriam. That would be very unusual to call anyone the son of a the woman, it was always the son of the father, which meant that they had great respect for her in Nazareth. It also confirms that uh, Joseph is absent. The people say, is this not the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. We know who he is. Who does he think he is? You wonder if the half siblings were there 
Were some of them still in their teens? Were they embarrassed or irritated? Did they sneak away as the crowd turned violent and tried to push Christ over the edge of the hill? Christ said, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. Jesus leaves Nazareth and goes to Capernaum where he stays intermittently during the next three years. The irony is that he then casts out many devils from a man there and those devils testify and witness that he is Christ, the Holy One of God, but he can't do miracles in Nazareth because of the unbelief of the people. We are certain that Mary always believed in her son as, as a divine being. But she's now raising children as a single mother. Probably her next son, James, had to preside over the family. We don't know if he welcomed that or felt resentful. But we think that Mary remained in Nazareth for the three years of Christ's ministry when he was traveling around Israel. In fact, the disciples tried to keep Jesus away from his family because, as John says, neither did his brethren believe in him. It reaffirms that they were not yet converted. Mark says that friends of Christ, and this would be translated as family in, in books other than the King James Version, heard of his behavior and they disapproved of it and said, quote, he is beside himself. He's crazy, they said. I don't know if they were trying to prevent his making a fool of themselves, if they were worried about their reputations. It must have been a heartbreak for Mary, who knew spiritually, in truth, who her son was. I think we need to think about how we try to reconcile differences between family members. There's one more interaction, and this is when maybe Mary or the brethren or a family member needed something. They tried to get his attention when he's teaching this big crowd of people. I'm sure they felt entitled. Christ used the occasion to point out how our most important allegiance is to God. And he says, and they would have heard this, my mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. There were some scribes from Jerusalem in the crowd. Perhaps he was trying to protect them a little bit from abuse, but I'm sure Mary was hurt. She was sad that none of her other children had accepted her divine son yet. Even though Mary and these half siblings were part of his physical family and had a close relationship with him, they needed to choose to become his disciples. Being related to or knowing the prophet or general authorities today does not ensure our salvation. As we choose to follow and obey Christ, our true relationship as well as that of his mortal mother mother mary and his half siblings is that in the eternities he becomes our spiritual father we become part of his spiritual family after the resurrection i think mary was really gratified that jesus appeared to his brother james and that later both james and jude wrote books in that are part of the new testament i hope all of this his half-siblings believed. We really don't know much of Mary's later life. After Christ ascended to heaven, the apostles met, and it says, with one accord in prayer and supplication to choose a new member of the quorum. Mary was there, even though she wouldn't have participated in the choice. She was also, I'm sure, there on the day of Pentecost when Christ ascends again to his father after spending the 40 days with his disciples and relatives in Israel. Now Mary became a joyful witness to the resurrection of her divine son. I think the most dreadful time in Mary's life was obviously the crucifixion. My mother used to, my mother-in-law used to say, when your child hurts, you bleed. And it was so much more than that for Mary. Now a sword pierces her soul. Perhaps she witnesses blood and water gushing from his body as it had from hers at birth. She chooses to be with her son, to subject herself to the pain of seeing her son die. She may even be ridiculed as the mother of this purported criminal. Supporting her were a, her sister and possibly two or three other women and the apostle John. And we don't read about any other apostles. We don't read about any of the other siblings being there. Perhaps 
they were not yet converted. Perhaps they were frightened of violence. While dying on the cross, Jesus assigns John to take care of his mother because he knows that John will live until he comes again. He knew that John would be able to take care of Mary until she died. John takes that assignment seriously. Mary lives with him in Jerusalem, and perhaps later, if the persecution got worse, she would have lived in a house in Ephesus with John. Some of Christ's last words on the cross are tenderly addressed to his mother. And th these words remind me of Christ's focus on each one of us. Savior, thou who suffered intensely on the cross, bearing the full burden of sin and sorrow for worlds, flesh pierced for the pains of our offenses, cleansing with beautiful blood our filthiness, bearing the full burden of sin and sorrow for worlds, mind fraught by the achings of our hearts, healing with mercy the agonies of our souls, bearing the full burden of sin and sorrow for worlds. How sore we know not, how exquisite we know not, how hard to bear we know not, bearing the full burden of sin and sorrow for worlds. And yet, woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother, Surely thou, who bore the full burden of sin and sorrow for worlds, cares for the one. I love and respect Mary. For mortality, Jesus Christ was also her beloved son. And I say these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.